passing moment. Let's stand to sing. 718. Passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear. He was Lord as kind beyond a measure, gives unto each day what he deems best. Lovingly, it's part of pain and pleasure, mingling toil with peace and rest. Every day the Lord himself is near me with a special mercy for each hour. All my cares he fain would take and cheer me, he whose name is Counselor and Paul. The protection of his child and treasure is a charge that on himself he laid. As your days your strength shall be in measure, this the pledge to me he has made. Help me then in every tribulation, so to trust thy promises, O Lord, that I lose not faith, sweet consolation, offered me within thy holy word. Help me, Lord, when toil and trouble meeting, ere to take as from a father's hand. One by one, the days, the moments fleeting, till I reach the promised land. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. The exciting book of Acts. We continue our study tonight in Acts chapter 9 as we move back to actually what has been uh, the end of chapter uh, 7, the beginning first part of chapter 8 with a little uh, narrative in between about Philip and his trip down to the desert. But we saw some persecution arising after the death of Stephen in uh, Acts chapter 7. And then we saw Philip going down to the desert and now we come back to the persecution, of the slaughter of the brethren, Saul breathing out these threatenings and these slaughterings and desiring to catch Christians and uh, bring them to Jerusalem in chains and then to have them put to death. You recall that last time we were together, we looked at the first part of the gift of evangelists in Acts chapter 8, verse 40. Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. We noted that there were two different kinds of gifts. There were the sign gifts, there were the service gifts. The sign gifts were very temporary in nature. They were only given during the apostolic period, that is, while the apostles were still alive and while the New Testament was being written. There were seven of those. And then there were the service gifts. There are 15 of those that remain for us today, one of which is the gift of evangelist. We notice that although there were miraculous workings in the Old Testament, that not all of the gifts find a parallel in the Old Testament. The gift of tongues, for example, has no parallel. The gift of interpretation of tongues has no parallel. Though we find prophetic utterances in the Old Testament, they were not given in the same manner in which the gift of prophecy was given in the New Testament. The Holy Spirit would come upon people. He would overpower them. They would be swept along irresistibly, and Peter explains that to us in 2 Peter 1.21, and then the Holy Spirit would leave them, and they would no longer have that gift. And we saw illustrations of that with the servants of Saul who went to try to uh, capture David. They fell down under the power of the Spirit and prophesied. 
And so Saul finally decided he had to do the job right himself, and he went, and the Holy Spirit came upon him. He stripped him naked, and he lay all day prophesying on the ground. He couldn't do anything about it. But the New Testament gift of prophet was under the control of those who had it. They were to speak only two or three at the most, and then they would have to wait one for another. That was none of the babbling and gibberish that goes on today in the charismatic churches where multiple people are talking at the same time. The manifestations that claim to be the seven sign gifts today are counterfeits. They're either from the world, the flesh, or the devil, and his demonic forces. Those gifts are no longer being given. But the gift of evangelist is still being given, and it likewise has no parallel in the Old Testament. We find no gift given whereby Jews would go out to evangelize and plant synagogues, or going out to Gentiles in the Old Testament. God was working under a different program with national Israel than he does with the church, which began with Jewish believers in Acts chapter 2, but ultimately was going to include the Samaritans and the Gentiles and those who were neither Jewish nor Gentile, those who were neither male nor female. It was a new program, and that is the reason for these new gifts. So we looked at the seven temporary sign gifts, the uh, 15 different specific gifts that were given for service. And we talked about the gift of evangelist with Philip showing up in Azotus after the Holy Spirit snatches him away from the Ethiopian eunuch and he passed through preaching and we saw that that word euangelizo is the word we would translate evangelized. In fact, that's where our word evangelized comes from is euangelizo. Uh, all the way from Ashdod, which is the town of Azotus in the Old Testament, its name was Ashdod, until he came to Caesarea. We noted that this was a very important city. It was one of the five Philistine cities that had given so much trouble to David in the days of David and King Saul. We saw that it was a major caravan route crossed at that point, and thus a very good place to start the spread of the gospel. God had sent one man with the gospel to Ethiopia after Philip led him to Christ, but that was way far down the road, 25 miles south of where the Spirit dropped Philip off. And so the Ethiopian went south, and Philip went north. It was at Gaza, one of those five Philistine cities, a place of terrorism today. God chose not to have the gospel spread in that area. Instead, he started at Ashdod, and moved farther north. Ashdod had felt the feel of the hand of God back in the days, you recall, when the Ark of the, uh, God was taken by the Philistines and it was brought to the house of Dagon and the next morning they found Dagon fallen down before the Ark. They set him up again. The next day they fall him, found him fallen down with his head and hands cut off and so they decided to get rid of the Ark. Ashdod Azotus was a place that had felt the power of God before. So these are two of the five principal cities of the Philistines, and the first is where Philip met the Ethiopian eunuch. The second is where he began his evangelization, which went 50 to 55 miles and covered all the cities in between in a period of 19 years. We saw that he had a normal family life. Someplace along the way, he met a nice girl whom uh, he married, a convert to Christ. He might have converted her in one of those cities along the coast, she might have been someone who had fled the persecution at Jerusalem and he ran into her again as he was going through those cities along the coast. We don't know the facts, but we know that God gave him a godly marriage. God gave him the right wife. God gave him the right children. God gave him four daughters. God gave him no sons. Instead, Philip was developing other young men and having them learn and share the gospel of Christ from his ministry. Now tonight we're in Acts 9, verses 1 and 2. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Rather interesting. There are a lot of things, of course, that happened between Acts chapter 8 and Acts chapter 21, which is where we saw Philip uh, at the end of uh, the ministry that God gave him. But now we're back on track.
Philip has left. He's gone to Samaria. He's gone to Gaza. Then he's been taken to Ashdod, and he begins to evangelize, heading north towards Caesarea. Not Caesarea Philippi, but Caesarea on the coast. And it's rather interesting also to note that persecution arose basically to get the church involved in their commission, which was to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth. I suspect that persecution is going to come to the church in the United States today because we have failed to do what we have been commissioned to do. That is, to carry the gospel to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth, which was the commission that was given by our Lord Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. We have, of all nations of the earth, been most blessed. We, of all nations of the earth, have had the greatest number of evangelists and Bible teachers and biblical resources in the English language so that we can read and study the Word of God. But we have hoarded it for ourselves and we have not reached out as we should. We find a very good and a very sobering illustration of what happens when the body of Christ does not obey the commands and the commissions that God gives to them. Now God clearly loves Christians. God clearly loves the body of Christ. God clearly wants to use us in his service. But if we will not be used in his service, he will guarantee that we will accomplish what he wants us to accomplish, either by taking us home to glory or by persecution, which forces us to do what he told us to do and which we unwillingly have refused to do. And so that's the point at which we find ourselves here in the text tonight. Saul, God has raised up a persecutor. Now God is going to use him and God is going to teach him how great things he must suffer for Jesus' sake. But at this point, God has raised Saul up to persecute the church. He's a very vitriolic persecutor. He's breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. He's not just someone who says, well, today's another day. I've got to get on with my job. I've got a commission here, and I've got to go out and sort of hunt around for some Christians, but I think I'll stop by the coffee shop first, then I'll run down to the barber and get myself a shave and a haircut. Uh, by that time, it'll probably be lunch, so maybe I'll hang out with some of my friends, and maybe this afternoon I'll wander around and see if anybody is yelling and screaming and saying, hey, I'm a Christian, please arrest me. Paul was not like that. He says he was breathing out threatenings and slaughter. I mean, this guy was muttering under his breath all the time. Where can I find those Christians? I've got to kill those Christians. Got to stop those Christians. Those Christians are messing up the Jewish religion. We got to stop the Christians so that they cannot carry on this heresy that's going on. I mean, he was fervent and in his attacks against believers, against the disciples of the Lord. When God wants to raise up persecution, folks, he will raise up people who are, from our perspective, irrational. He will raise up people who are angry, apparently for no cause. He will raise up people who are determined to stop us, even if it means killing us. We think it couldn't happen here in America. It has happened all over the world. There are believers today who have irrational and, in many cases, demon-possessed adversaries who are going after them to slit their throats, to blow them up with bombs, to kill them in the most horrible ways they possibly can. And folks, it could come to America, especially if we have failed to do what God has called us, commanded us, and commissioned us, and empowered us to do, which is to carry the gospel of Christ to the world. When God wants his people to spread out and they disobey, his force, he forces the spread because disobedience always leads to worse sins. Do we see sin in the church today? We sure do. We see those who call themselves Christians, who call themselves the church, and who are involved in some of the most abnormal, gross, and hideous sins that the planet has ever seen. You know that it's true. When we do not do what God calls us to do, it is only opening the door for greater sin. We see, for example, the people prior to the flood. God gave them a five-part dominion mandate, which included spreading out and filling the earth. God blessed them and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion. Five verbs there that tell them what they're supposed to do. 
They're to be fruitful. They're to multiply. They're to replenish, that is, to fill the earth. They are to subdue the earth. That was Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. We find by the time we get to Genesis chapter 6, they have failed in doing this. And as a result, they have entered into even more gross and vile sins than just the mere disobedience of the command. It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. And as you know, we've discussed this text when we went through the book of Genesis. Uh, this is not angels intermarrying with human beings. This is the godly line of Seth intermarrying with the ungodly line of Cain. And as a result, we have a great deal of wickedness. They disobeyed on the so-called little things, and they entered into much greater wickedness. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. And you'll notice it says that it was after the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and had children. That's finding us the so-called angelic theory in total disarray when you get down to verse 4. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. When you tolerate a little bit of sin, it always produces greater sin. When you disobey one of God's commands, it always opens the door to disobeying other of God's commands. When you disobey in what you think is a little area, it will result in your life in the multiplication of sin and in the judgment of God. It repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. And so we get back to one man again. God had started with Adam and Eve. He had given them a command. As we follow their generations and get to chapter 6, men disobeyed his command, and they became wicked in the earth. God comes back to one man. He comes back to Noah, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But then we get to our second example, because here we find Noah's descendants after the flood. God tells them to do the same thing. He gives the dominion mandate over, though he only restates three of the commands of the dominion mandate. Two of them, God gives them a promise that he will fulfill, but three of the commands he does restate. Genesis 9.1, God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish, that is, fill the earth. God wanted them to spread out and fill the earth. Subdue so and dominion commands are not repeated here in Genesis chapter 9. Instead, God gives them the promise that he would cause the animals, the birds, and the fish life to have a natural fear of man. Verse 2 says, And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand they are delivered. So rather than telling man to subdue them and have dominion over them, God restates it. He repeats the first three commands, but he restates the fact that he will now subdue the earth for man by placing all of these animals and fish and birds of fear in their hearts of man. But we discuss that, but we discover that the failure to obey God resulted again in a judgment that forced a scattering. Genesis 11. The whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Come, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. This is deliberate, willful disobedience to the command which God restated to Noah. When we deliberately disobey commands that God gives to us, he will bring judgment and he will bring scattering. 
They did not want to be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they all have one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Very interesting, as if we took time to study that verse there, what is going on. God made man with a brilliant mind and gave him abilities that we can only faintly hearken back to in our degenerated state after 6,000 years of people reproducing on this earth. Adam was a brilliant man. Those who followed him were brilliant men. The men after the flood were brilliant men, and if they had been allowed to retain their unity in one location, God himself says nothing would restrain them from what they would be able to do. And certainly, they would have multiplied their sin as we see happening prior to the flood. Go to, let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Now verse 8, it's our key verse. Because it's exactly what God does to the church at Jerusalem. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth and they left off to build the city. God's people never quite seem to learn the lessons that he's trying to communicate to us. Very clearly here, God does something because they did not obey his command. Therefore the name of it is called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. We find Babel all the way, named Babylon later in Scripture, but all the way through Scripture, all the way through the book of Revelation. It's going to end back there again because man, still in rebellion against God, wants to be united in a one-world government and a one-world religion, but not under the control of the God who made us, but under the control of Satan, the God of this world. The one who has sought always to move the people of God into a state of rebellion. He has the world in his pocket. But the church must learn to be obedient to Jesus Christ, its head, the one who is its bridegroom, the one who is its Lord and its King, the one who is its Savior and Redeemer, the one to whom someday each of us must give an account. Some of God's people did obey when he called them to move out, and they were blessed for their faith. Abraham is an illustration of that. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Not trying to establish a city of his own, not trying to establish a Babylon, so that he would not be scattered upon the face of the earth. He's a man who left a great city. He's a man who left home and country and family and friends. He's a man who obeyed when God called him to go. We discover this principle farther on in the scripture as we look to national Israel, or more particularly to Judah, the southern two tribes, after the uh, divided kingdom takes place. Israel failed to learn that principle. When God told them to go, they refused because God told them to go to the Babylonian captivity and if they would go, they would be blessed. But they resisted. They failed to obey and as a result, their punishment was even worse. Jeremiah petitioned the people to surrender and leave Jerusalem. Jeremiah 27, 12 and 13. I spake also to Zedekiah, king of Judah, according to all these words, saying, Bring your necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him and his people and live. Why will you die, thou and thy people, by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence, as the Lord has spoken against the nation that will not serve the king of Babylon? Jeremiah, and we find many passages in Jeremiah where he is giving this message, but that gives it to us succinctly. God had told Jeremiah, look, I'm going to destroy Jerusalem. So tell the king of Jerusalem and tell the elders of Jerusalem and tell the princes of Jerusalem and tell the priests of Jerusalem and tell the people of Jerusalem 
Guys, the city's going to fall. Now, if you want to live a quiet, peaceable life, go willingly into captivity with the king of Babylon, and you will be able to build houses in Babylon, you'll be able to marry in Babylon, you'll be able to raise families in Babylon, you'll be able to plant gardens and have a prosperous life in Babylon. But do it! Now, if we got a message like that, we would probably respond the way that the Jewish people who were in the city of Jerusalem and then in Judah and the southern two tribes of Judah, northern ten tribes that had already gone into captivity under Assyria. Now we have the two southern tribes and Nebuchadnezzar is aggressively approaching the land of Judah. If we heard that, most of us would say, that doesn't sound like a very good option to me. I think I'd rather resist. Well, that's the option that Judah chose. And as a result, the judgment that came upon them was far worse than the judgment would have been. God told them, I want you to go. I want you to scatter. I want you to come under the rule of the king of Babylon. And God promised them something. He said, it won't be forever. Though I scatter you, I will bring you back. In 70 years, I'm going to make this particular punishment last for 70 years. Listen to what it says, Jeremiah 29. For thus saith the Lord God, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me when ye search for me with all your heart. God promised them that that captivity would only last for 70 years, and so they could settle down in peace in Babylon for that time. And then he would come and rescue them. 29.10 For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. Oh, the political intrigue that you read in the book of Jeremiah, which is the longest book in the Bible. Political intrigue, much like the political intrigues that we see in our own government today. We find all kinds of parties interplaying and, and doing secret things and making secret pacts and uh, accusing Jeremiah and trying to get him and then certain people protecting him and then certain people actually managing to get hold of him and throw him in a pit. And There's all kinds of things that are going on in the book of Jeremiah. And it all revolved around that message. God said, scatter and I'll bless you and I'll bring you back. And the people refused and that's why these things happened. Then Shephatiah, the son of Matan, and Gedaliah, the son of Pashur, and Jukal, the son of Shelemiah, and Pashur, the son of Milkiah, heard the words that Jeremiah had spoken unto all the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, He that remaineth in this city shall die by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. But he that goeth forth to the Chaldeans shall live, for he shall have his life for a prey, and shall live. Thus saith the Lord, this city shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon's army, which shall take it. Dear people, if you and I could know the mind of God concerning the United States, if we had still today the gift of prophet, who would proclaim the infallible word of the Lord, and would say to us in this place, you people at Bible Presbyterian Church in Collingswood and all you Christians throughout this land need to fly, flee either to South America or to Canada or somewhere else because there are going to come days here in this country where all the Christians who are left behind and who will not obey will be thrown into prison, will be tortured and will be killed. And if we knew this was a prophet from God and that his word would true, was true and that it would soon happen. Only you can look at your own heart. Would you obey the word of the Lord? Would you get up and leave it all behind and go? 
Or would you argue, well, I'm too old for that? Or my assets are not liquid, I can't do that. Or my house is here, I mean, where am I going to go? Or my family's here, my kids are here, my grandkids are here. No, no, I, I'm not going to believe that. I'm going to stay behind and I'm going to resist. That's what the people did in Judah when God told them to scatter. That's what happened to those who refused to scatter in Jerusalem when God told them to go. The people before the flood refused to obey and God killed them all. The people after the flood, when they tried to build the tower, God confounded their language and forced the dispersal. What do we find here in Jeremiah? Therefore the princes said unto the king, We beseech thee, let this man be put to death, for thus he weakeneth the hands of the men of war that remain in this city, and the hands of all the people in speaking such words unto them. For this man seeketh not the welfare of this people, but the hurt. When you preach an unpopular message, you will discover that it is twisted to mean that which it does not mean. Jeremiah had proclaimed that the good word of the Lord had come unto him, and that God meant them good and not evil, and that if they would obey him, they would receive his blessing. But the princess said, This man does not seek the welfare of the people, but the hurt. Then Zedekiah the king said, Behold, he is in your hand, for the king is not he that can do anything against you. It was a weak puppet king. It was a king who had no authority. He had no backbone. He had no strength. The princes come and they say, We've we got to get rid of Jeremiah. Then took they Jeremiah and cast him into the dungeon of Malchiah, the son of Hamelech, that was in the court of the prison, and they let Jeremiah down with cords, and in the dungeon there was no water but mire. So Jeremiah sunk in the mire. Now when Ebed Melech the Ethiopian, rather interesting as you consider that we've just dealt with Philip and the Ethiopian, when Ebed Melech the Ethiopian, one of the eunuchs, and it was an Ethiopian eunuch, which was of the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon, the king then sitting in the gate of Benjamin, Ebed Melech went forth out of the king's house and spake to the king, saying, My lord, the king, these men have done evil in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they have cast into the dungeon. And he is like to die for hunger in the place where he is, for there is no bread in the city. Then the king commanded Ebed Melech the Ethiopian, saying, Take from hence thirty men with thee, and take up Jeremiah the prophet out of the dungeon before he die. So Ebed Melech took the men with him, and went into the king's house under the treasury, and took thence old cast clouts and old rotten rags and let them down by cords into the dungeon to Jeremiah. And Ebed Melech the Ethiopian said unto Jeremiah, Put now these old cast clouts and rotten rags under thine armholes under the cords. And Jeremiah did so. So they drew up Jeremiah with cords and took him out of the dungeon. And Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. Sunk into the mud, that vacuum suction would have ripped his arms out if they had just pulled him up with the cords. When you carry a message that is not appreciated, you may find yourself in severe difficulty with those around you who do not like the message. Then we have an interesting narrative. Then Zedekiah the king sent and took Jeremiah the prophet unto him. Into the third entry that is in the house of the Lord, the king said unto Jeremiah, I will ask thee a thing, hide nothing from me. Then Jeremiah said unto Zedekiah, If I declare it unto thee, wilt thou not surely put me to death? And if I give thee counsel, wilt thou not hearken unto me? So Zedekiah the king swore secretly unto Jeremiah, saying, As the Lord liveth that made us this soul, I will not put thee to death, neither will I give thee into the hand of these men that seek thy life. Then Jeremiah said unto Zedekiah, Thus saith the Lord, The Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, if thou wilt assuredly go forth unto the king of Babylon's princes, then thy soul shall live, and this city shall not be burned with fire, and thou shalt live, and thine house. But if thou wilt not go forth to the king of Babylon's princes, then shall this city be given into the hand of the Chaldeans, and they shall burn it with fire, and thou shall not escape out of their hand. How we fear men, 
The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Persecution was coming to the church at the beginning of Acts chapter 8, and then that narrative picks up again in our verses tonight in Acts chapter 9. But the church had been told to scatter. It was not merely a result of their fear that they scattered. It was their disobedience that kept them in one place, and God brought persecution to force them to scatter. Here we find the same thing taking place, but here it is the fear of man that is bringing the snare. But the Bible tells us, Whoso put his trust in the Lord shall be safe. And Zedekiah the king said unto Jeremiah, I am afraid of the Jews that are fallen to the Chaldeans, lest they deliver me into their hand, and they mock me. <laughs> what foolish things we fear. His actions are based on fear. His actions are also based on pride. I'm afraid that I'll get caught and then they will mock me. Have you ever been afraid of being mocked? The believers in the New Testament were mocked all the time. They were scorned, they were laughed, they were spit on. And yes, they were persecuted. How we want to retain our pride, our dignity, so that no one will mock us. We'll still be considered cool. If we make just the right compromises, then we'll fit in with the crowd and not stick out, and nobody will come along with a mower trying to level us down with the rest of the crowd. The king was afraid of being mocked. But Jeremiah said, They shall not deliver thee. Obey, I beseech thee, the voice of the Lord, which I speak unto thee. So it shall be well unto thee, and thy soul shall live. Jeremiah is pleading with the king for obedience. Pleading with the king that he would obey the voice of the Lord. The Spirit of God pleads with us as well. Obey the voice of the Lord and live. If only we would learn obedience. But we want to run it through our own grid first. We want to run it past the door called fear first and see if there's anything in this command that we're afraid to do. And then if there is, then we stop at the door of fear and we refuse to move forward and obey what God has called us to do. Has God ever called you into full-time Christian service? That's the term we give to it today. It falls into many different categories. It falls into many different clusters. Obeying in terms of a call to preach, obeying in terms of a call to go to the mission field, obeying in terms of the call to, to teach Christian school, obeying the call to witness on a regular daily basis. Obedience to the call to spend time in prayer and fasting Obedience to the call to spend time in studying God's word and really studying it. Where are we not obeying? When we do not obey, God causes circumstances whereby we earnestly desire the freedom that we had so that we can obey rather than simply being forced into it. That was the problem here with Zedekiah. Obey, I beseech thee, the voice of the Lord, which I speak unto thee, so it shall be well unto thee, and thy soul shall live. Obedience brings blessing. But if thou refuse to go forth, this is the word which the Lord hath showed me. And behold, all the women that are left in the kings of Judah's house shall be brought forth to the king of Babylon's princes. And those women shall say, Thy friends have set thee on, and have prevailed against thee. Thy feet are sunk in the mire, and they be turned away back. <laughs> Jeremiah had just been pulled out of the mire. And now we find that his harem is going to be given to the princes of the king of Babylon. And the women are going to mock him and say, You're just like the guy that they threw down in that mire pit. Your feet are stuck in the mire. You can't get out. You can't do anything to help us. The very mockings that he feared would come to him. 
So shall they bring out all thy wives and thy children to the Chaldeans, and thou shalt not escape out of their hand, but shalt be taken by the hand of the king of Babylon, and thou shalt cause this city to be burned with fire. Disobedience by the king would not only have personal consequences, disobedience by the king would bring judgment upon the city. He said, Thou shalt cause this city to be burned with fire. Weak need, wishy-washy, butterflies in his stomach. Zedekiah was afraid to obey the word of the Lord. And so God told him the very things that you are afraid of are the things that are going to come on you. And you will also cause this city to be burned with fire. Dear people, when we disobey the word of the Lord, it affects not only us, but it affects those around us. When we disobey the word of the Lord, it causes judgment on others. And that is what Zedekiah was about to experience. Then said Zedekiah unto Jeremiah, Let no man know of these words, and thou shalt not die. But if the princes hear that I have talked with thee, and they come unto thee, and say unto thee, Declare unto us now what thou hast said unto the king. Hide it not from us, and we will not put thee to death. Also what the king said unto thee. Then thou shalt say unto them, I presented my supplication before the king, that he would not cause me to return to Jonathan's house to die there. Then came all the princes unto Jeremiah and asked him. And he told them according to all these words that the king had commanded. So they left off speaking with him, for the matter was not perceived. So Jeremiah abode in the court of the prison until the day that Jerusalem was taken. And he was there when Jerusalem was taken. Zedekiah would not obey. And so God sent judgment, and God took the Jews into captivity. The church had disobeyed their commission to spread out and to carry the gospel, so God sent persecution. You remember in Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 6, But when they were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom unto Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And that's what brought us to Acts 8, 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout all the regions of Judea and Samaria. They were moving out according to the commission given in Acts chapter 1. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, and hailing men and women committed them to prison. You see, there were some who didn't obey. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Those that obeyed had opportunity for service. Those that obeyed had opportunity for witness. Those who disobeyed were taken prisoner and tortured and put to death. Just like the book of Jeremiah. When will God's people learn? They that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word, then went Philip down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Our text tonight in Acts chapter 9 picks up immediately after verse 5 as we begin to track Saul, who becomes the Apostle Paul. There was that interlude with Philip that we looked at. Samaria was an interesting place for Philip to go because it doesn't ever indicate that Saul was willing to go to Samaria. You see, Saul was a good Jew and the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. He didn't care about members of the church going to Samaria. He cared about Christians who were going to the synagogues. And there were no Jewish synagogues in Samaria. 
In Jerusalem, he's going house to house and finding them. But on his way to Damascus, where does it tell us he was going to go? He was going to go to the synagogues and try to find out those who were disciples, those who were believers in the way. There were Jews who were, were merchants and who traveled to other parts of the world, and wherever they went, they established synagogues. And so now, as Jews who have trusted Christ are leaving Jerusalem, Saul begins to realize that there are going to be a bunch of them who go to the synagogues and preach Christ and tell those Jews in those spread abroad synagogues that Jesus is the Messiah and Saul was determined to stop it before they got too far. That's why Philip had such a great time down at Samaria. That's why Philip never had any interference from Saul because Saul was a good Jew and he knew there were no synagogues in Samaria and the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans and he didn't want to walk through Samaria. He didn't want to get his feet dirty with Samaritan cooties. Saul was determined to find Christians in the synagogues. You know, sometimes God sends us to places where there's no persecution because it's simply abhorrent to those who would follow and persecute. They don't want to be in those kinds of conditions. You know, the rather interesting, as you remember the story of William Tyndale, who translated the scriptures into English, how he had to flee to the continent. And he fled from city to city to city. Well, where he usually went was to the outcasts. Where he usually went was to the people we would call sort of vagabond types, street people. And it was there that he hid out for years and led many people to Christ and ministered among them. And the king couldn't find him. Finally, he had to get a thief by the name of Harry Phillips to track him down. Because Harry Phillips didn't mind mingling in that kind of society and crowd. And eventually he found William Tyndale. And you know the story of how William Tyndale was strangled and burned at the stake and his last words were, God opened the eyes of the King of England. And shortly thereafter, the king approved the translation of the scriptures into English to be put in every church in the land of England. What God will do with those people who obey. What God will do with those people who obey. Even in times of persecution and distress, God always uses what the world calls evil for our good. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. God is working those things together for our good. All things, because we love him, we're called according to his purpose. But we like those verses there, and the wonderful verses that follow, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. But then he begins to list the things, and we think of it positively because we say, Nothing can separate us from the love of God, but he lists the things that are going to happen. He tells us the things that are going to happen to those who have placed their faith in Christ. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation? That's going to happen because the devil will try to separate you from the love of God. Shall distress or persecution? Those things are going to happen to those who have placed their faith in Christ or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. Dear friends, he's listing what has happened to the church over the last 2,000 years. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. 
What was it that Saul was breathing out? Saul was breathing out threatenings and slaughter. We are accounted all the day long as sheep for the slaughter. But we have this guarantee. Nay, I am in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is why we do not have to stop at the door of fear to check out the commands of God. That is why we do not have to wait and see if fear pops its head out and says, but if you obey God, this might happen. Dear friends, we know those things are going to happen anyway. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. It's time for us to stop pausing at the door of fear and merely obey and do what God has called us to do. Suffering is going to come to the church. Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3, Thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. Was there anything wrong with those things? Was Paul faithful in all of those things? Yes. Paul had true doctrine. He had a godly life. He had purpose. He had faith. He had long-suffering. He had charity. He had patience. And what did he get for it? Persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. You say, yeah, but that was Paul. I mean, Paul was really a super Christian. Well, let's look at the very next verse. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Are we going to live godly in Christ Jesus? Are we going to obey God's word? Are we going to make sure that our lives count for Christ in spreading the gospel of Christ to those who have not heard? That was the failure of the church at Jerusalem. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Dear people, you have heard the word of God preached from this pulpit for the last 75 years. You know the scriptures which are able to make you wise unto salvation. You are a repository of those scriptures. You have heard the exhortations to carry that word of God to others. Are you doing it? Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. But be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, even though there'll be people like Saul who was breathing out threatenings and slaughters against the church, against the disciples of the Lord, actively pursuing them, not only from house to house in Jerusalem, but then getting commissions to go to other cities where the synagogues were located so that he might find and worm out the believers who were there. Even though there be those who think that the doctrine of the scripture is heresy and they want to stamp it out. Help us to remember that we need to fear none of these things. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. All that will obey will suffer opposition from Satan and his host. All those who make an impact in this world will find the world and the flesh rising up in opposition. Help us, Father, to be faithful unto death, for we know that our Lord has promised a crown of life to those who are. Thank you, Father, once again for this, your word. We pray that you will bless it to our hearts and make us an obedient people, doing what you've called us to do. 
so that you don't have to force us to do it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.